Oh, New York ain't New York anymore. How I miss those old pals of mine. Everybody has tapped their toe to the timeless tunes of George Gershwin. But we may never have heard those memorable songs in quite the same way, never have gotten them stuck in our heads or whistled them on our way to work, without the love of his life, Catherine Faulkner Swift, who George nicknamed K. Mitchell James Kaplan brings us their jazz age romance in his latest novel, Rhapsody. Hello, history lovers, and welcome. You know me, I am your host, Dean Carianis. This is the History Author Show on iHeartRadio, and a special tip of the hat to everybody watching today's time travel adventure via our YouTube channel. We have some looks back today that I think you're really going to enjoy if you are, say, casting us onto your TV or watching on your computer. In this episode, we are going to meet that restless society wife who attends a concert that forever changes her world, but also the face of musical theater forever. The song that sparks this transformation is Rhapsody in Blue, composed by that young genius, George Gershwin. Mitchell James Kaplan is a man who knows his way around a concert hall, and he also earned a BA in English Literature at Yale University, where he won the prestigious Payne Memorial Prize. His previous novels are Into the Unbounded Night and By Fire by Water. Check out those at MitchellJamesKaplan.com or you can find our guest on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn where you can track down me as well. Okay, now that we've put the record on the phonograph, let's join Mitchell James Kaplan and go behind the music with Rhapsody. And here we are with novelist Mitchell James Kaplan. He's the author of Rhapsody. Thanks so much for making the time to chat with the History Author Show. Thank you, Dean. I really enjoyed Rhapsody. As you can see, I pointed out I'm wearing my Rhapsody blue shirt. I chose a shirt that's appropriate for the book. This beautiful cover. If you saw this novel and you were of a novel frame of mind, tell me you wouldn't pick it up. They did a beautiful job on it. And when you did pick it up, you would see the first couple lines of Rhapsody. And they read, so dreadfully wet outside, water spraying down like Morton Salt in the Ladies Home Journal advertisement. So when I read that, Mitchell, I hear the, the clipped sounds there, the, the real short sentence. And I wanted to ask you, since you're a musician, when you thought about people picking up the book for the first time, the, the way that you write in general, do you think that you want to draw your readers in the way that a catchy song by George Gershwin or by K Swift will draw them in? Is that part of the way that you hear prose, the way that you hear music? I would say absolutely, definitely. When I started college, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to be a composer or an author. I ended up studying poetry and as you know, poetry, at least prior to the 20th century, was very much about rhythms. I still feel that the musical quality of prose is really what distinguishes good prose from ordinary prose. As far as this particular book goes, those rhythms, I think, came to me unconsciously in response to the cadences of the music I was writing about. I think you you hit on something with your question. I know that, in fact, I was just discussing this with a, another novelist the other day who was talking about the tone of her new novel and how it's kind of surprising her. And I said, you know, I've come to feel that you have to listen to your novel and you have to accommodate your novel because your novel wants to speak in a certain tone, in a certain voice, with a certain style, and you have to learn to work with it and you slowly fall in love with each other. It may be a style that, that you weren't expecting, but it emerges during the process of writing the first draft and then you hone it and improve it during subsequent drafts. So I feel like it's part of the way the book wanted to talk and that in itself was probably unconsciously maybe filtering something that came from this music. 
Speaking of your inspiration and your heart, really, I felt like I was reading your heart in every page of Rhapsody, not to mention your two main characters. You dedicate the novel to your late father who worked his way through medical school as a jazz clarinet virtuoso. And he has this great moment later when he's a practicing cardiologist where he has a brush with greatness. And that's something I think if you decided to put it in one of your novels that they probably would tell you the editor, well, that would <laughs> never happen. And they, the, why would that happen? So right. tell us about, you have this music in your ears, then you have your, your father in your ears. I've heard you tell this story before and I want you to tell it again here for listeners that hopefully will become readers about how you get inspired to write this book and why when people pick up a copy of Rhapsody, they're really picking up a piece of your heart. Yeah, well, that's true in many, many ways. Um, but in, in particular, with regard to that anecdote, uh, which is a beautiful and moving anecdote for me, uh, my father had played jazz, music jazz clarinet all through uh, college and medical school and actually earned his uh, tuition playing jazz clarinet and had an opportunity to play with some of the greats. You know, he became a cardiologist. He was a professor at UCLA. And one day they wheeled Duke Ellington into his office as a patient. And my father told him, Mr. Ellington, you're one of my greatest heroes. And uh, he came home that day and told us that over dinner, you know, they, Duke Ellington came and saw me today and I told him he was one of my greatest heroes. And that story brings tears to my eyes to this day. And, you know, there's a very personal level of it, having known my father and his love for music, which was the great passion of his life uh, as far as um, that area of his life is concerned. But it's also a, a literary novelistic kind of reversal, as you point out, to be asked to care for a man whose music provided uh, nurture for your soul all those years. I'd say when you write a novel like this, you're connecting with people. And in this case, my father had recently died when I started writing Rhapsody. And I feel like I connected with some of his heroes through him. So you could say I had my brush with greatness, which in a way maybe mirrored his brush with greatness when they wheeled Duke Ellington into his office. So wonderful that you shared it with us. That's such a personal story, but this is the novelist's job, right? To mine your own experiences and dig up that gold that is so often, so many places in Rhapsody. And it's a book that I just really hope people will pick up and experience it because I only get to ask a few questions and just try to whet their appetites and get them thinking about this amazing love story and the way that you describe it on the page. But you're also writing about almost a century ago. And so I know when I read, read about the jazz age, I expect, well, there's going to be some there's going to be some racism in it. It's probably going to be very overt. People spoke in a different way. And I'm interested to see how a novelist handles that. But in the case of Rhapsody, you're really blessed with George Gershwin in that he's a man that's so ahead of his time. And he's somebody who loves music across this enforced, legally enforced racial divide. And so he's up there in Harlem. He's knowing these figures that, that you were just speaking about, guys like Duke Ellington, the ones who come before him and after him. And he's inspired by that. Was that a relief for you? How did it feel to say, boy, I can write about somebody that I admire her. I don't have to try to put different words in his mouth so I don't offend or take 2021 readers out of the book. Yeah, I would say that um, there are a lot of questions built into that question that you just posed. Uh, one of them is another of the reasons I was motivated to write this book. There's that personal story that I just told you and the connection with my father and some of his heroes and the music that he loved so much. And on another level, there's a personal curiosity that has something to do with this time that we're living in right now, where we're so very, very conscious of race. Uh, and I thought of the origin of jazz as a very interesting angle on the, on the subject of, of race and race relations, because the great American music, musical idiom, and pretty much everyone would say is jazz. And 
Jazz very much involves a melting of a lot of different musical strains and musical cultures, but uh, obviously the, the Black contribution is essential and paramount. And the fact that, that some of the great early composers in the field of Broadway music who started to pay attention to jazz were so much aware of these exciting things that were happening up in Harlem, especially George Gershwin. All of that puts these questions of racial race relations in a different light that I really wanted to explore. I thought it was important because we're talking about America, we're talking about American culture, we're talking about what makes it, what is America's great contribution to world culture. Uh, jazz is one of those great contributions. How did it happen? What does it say about how people were able to reach across ethnic, cultural, so-called racial divides back in those days in the 20s. You're right. Certain kinds of language would sound very, very racist today if we use that language that were commonly used in those days. And they might not have had the exact same connotations that some words have today. On the other hand, other words might have been stronger, might have sounded weaker in those times. So. I'd say that the meanings of words change over time, especially slang. When you're writing a historical novel, you have to take that into consideration. You can't use words in the exact same way they were used during the period you're writing about, but at the same time, you want it to sound authentic. So in my case, I do take some risks, but I don't want to take so many risks that I'm going to be offending people uh, with language that, that might have that might be less appropriate today or sound less appropriate than it might have sounded in those days. So this compromise, again, that's a, I've given you a very complex answer. Your question was kind of complex. <laughs> I, it was. So I apologize for that. It's because I really, I enjoy the mechanics of the book and I can see, I read the music on the page. I would, I read the words here in Rhapsody and I can see all the hard work that went into those little choices. And that's why I wanted to break that down about that language and that really praiseworthy part of George Gershwin, because the bottom line for people that are going to pick it up and maybe repelled by is that Kay is married to somebody else at the time. And I don't know how you do that personally. I, I joke to my wife, I say, I don't know how people have affairs because I feel guilty if I go to a different Dwayne Reed. You know, I'm afraid that the cashier from my regular Dwayne Reed is going to see me <laughs> on the streets of Manhattan and wonder why I'm <laughs> buying my milk for my coffee there. So this is something that you, you can't get around. You don't try to get around, but you also use it very effectively to tell the story. So how, how do you deal with that? And I know you have a, a perspective on that from living in Europe for a time that allowed you, I think, to relate to that better than maybe somebody like me who's so loyal to one Dwayne Reed. Not that you're not a loyal guy. <laughs> <laughs> well, you are right about that. But to, to tell the truth, I have not told this story before. After I graduated from college, I worked for two years as an au pair in Paris. Which, uh, but the family that I was working for, they were a very powerful political and industrial kind of entity in France. So they had a chauffeur and a cook and several houses. And, and they had one American who had breakfast with the kids and spoke English and one who had lunch with the kids and spoke English. The whole purpose of my being there was to speak English with the kids. But one of the things I absorbed while living in this kind of very powerful political milieu in France was, you know, yeah, it was exactly what people think um, in terms of the way that two parents in the family related to each other and to other people. It was a kind of a personal experience of how two people can be very much loyal to each other and love each other and still be having quite, I mean, in a, in a discreet way, but in a way that was obvious to me, having other things going on on the side. Uh, and that was part of the culture and it was accepted. I wasn't overtly thinking about that, but yeah, it probably did inform my way of seeing Kay and Jimmy and George. Jimmy Warburg comes from Europe and he comes from kind of a European elite culture. And I would think that he would have been exposed to that same kind of marital tradition. The really interesting thing about this is that they somehow make it work. It's difficult. It's complicated. It's not stable. A triangle is not a stable thing. Kay is really 
the person who messes it up because she falls in love with George. Jimmy kind of expects an open marriage and accepts that, although he wants discretion. George is not particularly interested in marriage, um, but Kay falls in love. And that is kind of what throws a wrench into the whole thing. <laughs> what keeps it going though, is music. You know, Kay and George have a very su mutually supportive musical artistic relationship that is, I think, very beneficial to both of them. And I found that that was such an important thing for me because we tend to think of these kinds of relationships as being, you know, exploitative very often between, you know, an artist and another artist and one is famous, one is a little less famous. But I don't think that's the case here. I mean, George Gershwin was already famous when he met Kay. He didn't need her help to become famous or to stay famous. She was already a, an accomplished, brilliant musician when she met him. And they did help each other and support each other, but I think it was mutual. And I think that's an important point. As far as Jimmy goes, it's a very touching moment when she decides to write a musical and Jimmy comes up with the idea that he'll write the lyrics. And I think at that point, he knows his marriage is in trouble. And this is kind of a Hail Mary moment. Okay. Uh, this is a, a way for him maybe to keep himself relevant in Kay's life in terms of her aspirations and, you know, her passions. So, yeah, as I say, it's complicated, but they all are kind of constantly trying to make it work and make and accept each other and accept the situation and live with it as best they can. There's a moment in Rhapsody that this nickname that Gershwin gives her, Catherine Swift, he said, calls her Kay, and where her husband, Jimmy, calls her Catherine and she says, well, you say for her, I assume this isn't her exact words, but you say, Catherine, meaning the name, now felt like a discarded dress, ill-fitting and out of date. So that's a transformation that she has undergone and she's become Kay from this wife, Catherine. So I wonder how much of that new person replacing the old drove you in your writing and made you say this is a moment or was that just you're that good and you just that was just a moment that was a good moment you went and you went right past it because that seems like such skillful character development a real break for her character well i mean I, i'm not going to deny that i was conscious of the fact that uh it was an opportunity for me that k that george changes k's name it actually happened that way and so i took advantage of it <laughs> because it's a nice way to sh shine a light on that uh character arc. So yes, you notice that. And yes, to some extent, it's deliberate. But I, I was really just taking advantage of an opportunity that presented itself to me. I would say that when we talk about characters growing in a novel, it sounds like we're talking about you know, something that comes out of an MFA writing course. But I think in reality, it comes out of life. You know, and we grow, hopefully. <laughs> as of our experiences and maturing and being exposed to new kinds of situations, you know, Kay comes from one kind of life, a bohemian, artistic, you know, a very impressive family background in a, in a certain, you might say, parochial, classical kind of tradition. And um, she moves into a very different kind of life with Jimmy Warburg, the elite of New York society. And, um, and then when she discovers what's going on in the jazz scene and gets to know George Gershwin, her life is expanding further. So of course, uh, her tastes, her ways of interacting with people, I'm not gonna say the essence of her personality, but the, some of the ways that that personality finds expression are going to evolve. Um, but the essence, the core, I hope there's a through line also, which she's this ebullient, uh, curious, intelligent woman from beginning to end and witty. I yes, think. also comes through. Yeah, it, it you, you really feel as if you get to know them. And I can talk about Rhapsody, but this is one more reason I like to ask novelists to choose something to read to us a little brief passage, a couple of sentences, because what you choose will give us some insight into what you find interesting as an author and also a taste for your writing that I did so enjoy. So set up this bit from Rhapsody and have at it. 
Okay, so um, I, I'll read to you a scene uh, when Kay meets George Gershwin for the first time. She's aware of him. She's very impressed with him. She's a, a little bit um, maybe daunted by some of uh, what she's seen of him, but she's never met him before. It's during a party and she's in, she has invited among the other guests at a party at their, uh, at their residence, her residence with Jimmy Warburg. She's invited Yasha Heifetz and his sister Pauline. So she goes, you know, they're answering the door, people are drinking, people are necking and so forth. It's the roaring twenties and it's crazy. And um, she goes to the door and here we go. Other guests knocked at the door. This time, Catherine opened to reveal her friend Pauline, who stood with a man Catherine recognized all too well, though she had never seen him quite this close. He stood about five foot eleven in a tailored pinstripe suit, but his presence exceeded his physical stature. Catherine noticed the eyes, dark with a faraway, softened look, as if focusing on something beyond the party, the people, or the place. They met and acknowledged hers, but floated away again, finally alighting on the Steinway Grand in the center of the room. He smiled as if he had spotted an old friend stepping off the New Haven Express in Grand Central Terminal, George Gershwin. Yasha was beat, I let him sleep, said Pauline. Catherine escorted them in. I'll have a Biondi Santi Brunello de Montalcino, said Pauline. Catherine laughed. Would you settle for a Frascati? Whatever. Pauline took a flute of Perrier Jouet from one of the waiter's trays. As they glided toward the center of the room, Catherine turned to the composer. And you, Mr. Gershwin, some brandy? He shook his head briskly as if the thought had dampened his hair. Something fizzy. How about a sparkling gin lemonade? Sounds swell, but without the gin and without the lemonade. Just the bubbles, laughed Catherine. That would hit the spot. Mind if I... He completed his question with a wave at the piano. Of course not, please. He sat down and began playing a rousing anthem. The conversations and laughter subsided. Gershwin's hands swept across the keyboard, rushing into the air a multiplicity of simple tunes that wound through or bounced off each other, disappeared, re-emerged, and recombined in the treble or bass register, adorned with grace notes and triplet flourishes. Sometimes he hammered on one tone while moving chords and surprising patterns underneath, contrasting simplicity with sophistication. Other times he flattened the climactic note in a series, layering in a shade of nostalgia or regret. Pauline leaned close to Catherine. He can play all right. Trouble is, no one taught him how to stop playing. Is he your date or a friend? asked Catherine. He was my date, now he's a friend. What happened? Nothing, that's the problem. And then she corrected herself. I don't mean nothing, but well, nothing. The music pivoted, the mood shifted. A sorrowful melody tinged with philosophical big chords that slid through half-step gradations, implying key changes, like a man drunk on love, swaying and lurching through a gas lamp lit alley. The room held its breath as the guests congregated around the piano. Olga set a glass of seltzer near the music stand. Leading that intoxicated personification of his melody from the alley into a wide open field, Gershwin ragged up the same romantic tune. The melody man danced into the middle of the meadow, kicked up his legs and flailed his arms, throwing back his head. He crouched, spun and whirled and slowly crumpled to the ground in a graceful heap. Catherine had no idea how long Gershwin had been playing when he paused to sip his seltzer, oblivious to the enchanted crowd. But he could not ignore them long for they broke into applause. He turned to Catherine, a gleam in his eyes. Say, I hear you've got a wicked left hand yourself. Both of my hands are wicked, Mr. Gershwin, said Catherine. Why don't you serenade us with something you picked up at the Institute? He rose, clutching his highball glass and seating the bench. 
What did you tell him about me? Catherine whispered to Pauline. Only that you're blessed with two of the finest ears in the city and fingers to match. Catherine grimaced and headed to the piano where she played the portion of the Rhapsody in Blue that she had worked out, the slow portion. After several bars, Gershwin lowered his half empty glass to a side table and crouched behind her, extending his arms on either side of hers. Her scent teased his nose, cigars and an eau de toilette melange of citrus, sandalwood and bergamot. He began embellishing and soon their melodies intertwined. Catherine glanced up at Jimmy, who stood near the end of the piano, watching and smiling in his ambiguous way. Gershwin added notes in other implied time signatures, triplets against eighth notes in exotic keys and bumped up the rhythm so that Catherine soon felt she was his accompanist rather than the other way around. Nor was she adept at this style of accompaniment, which involved reading the other player's mind rather than looking at notes on a printed page. Flexibility and instinct rather than calculation and precision. Together, they waded further beyond her waters. She tried to swim, but flailed. It may not have been noticeable to the others, but Gershwin knew. She felt uncomfortably warm, a flush she did not care to name or recognize. She worried others might notice, but glancing around the room, saw no sign they did. As her eyes returned to the keyboard, her fingers stumbled. That was mortifying. And I guess I can stop there. <laughs> It was perfect. It, so many things. People really do get a flavor for your writing and little things like the gas lamp. This would be in memory for them. And it also right. it also has a has a few meanings. You can just stop and dwell over little yeah. phrases like that. But it also leads perfectly to my next question, because you show them they're playing together for the first time, really collaborating, we could say, for the first time. The, the germ, the beginning of that relationship, it starts to sprout. She... Kay Swift is not somebody that's just a sidekick or just is a woman of leisure sitting off in a hotel where Gershwin keeps her, but she's the first woman to score an entire hit Broadway musical, 1930s, fine and dandy. Uh, we can all think of instances, though, where we maybe collaborated with somebody we loved. In fact, my cookbook is back here that I wrote with my wife, and that was one of the first big things we collaborated on. We learned a lot about each other. But never mind somebody famous like Gershwin. Everybody stops when he walks in the room. Everybody's hoping that he plays the piano. It's so easy for somebody like that to get a big head and to just expect everybody else, just bring me that seltzer toots and, and don't you. What do you think? You're going to get your name on a playbill? I don't think so. So I, I wonder what we can learn from this novel and from this real true relationship at the center of it about that, about how he dealt with Kay's solo success and how when we collaborate with somebody that we care about, how we can make sure that it goes as smoothly as their love did. Well, I mean, smoothly might be a bit of an you know, oversimplification if you don't mind my saying so. Sure. But, but I'd say that, it, as I said, mutually supportive. And I, I, it's a beautiful little anecdote that I didn't put in the book, but it, maybe it should have been there. You know, you're always cutting when you're writing a novel, as you know, <laughs> it's mostly cutting. When uh, in 1930, when Fine and Dandy was number two, the number two hit show on Broadway, the number one hit show was Gershwin's Girl Crazy, <laughs> same season. <laughs> they were the number one and number two show, which is pretty cool, really. Yeah. Uh, it says a lot. It says a lot. I mean, I could go into my personal life. Um, I will just say that, yes, I have... I've collaborated with a number of people and I continue to collaborate with people. The most important collaborator is my wife and uh, she reads everything I write 50 million times. And I do worry about it being exploitative at times, but she loves it and she wants, she cherishes that role. And I too cherish the role she plays and I dedicate every book to her, you know, I hope that if she ever writes a novel, I'll be just as supportive of her as she is of me. It's not something I ever asked for, but it is a, a gift from God, as far as I'm concerned, that I happen to be married with someone so brilliant. That I mean, she is the toughest critic I have ever met. And you know, she will read every draft of my books and it'll, they come back just <laughs> looking like, you know, like crap, <laughs> all marked up. <laughs> You need that though. You need the marks. Yes. And, yeah. yes. 
maybe that's what I'm picking up in the book. I'll go back and try to salvage it. Is your relationship? Maybe that's what's coming through. But that is that is so great to hear because it is important. And you look at that and whatever troubles they had, they produce all of this wonderful, great music and out of something that that could have just been so troubling along the way so much. There's a reason why you're still writing and we're still reading about this relationship 100 years later. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right. It's a very important and a very inspiring thing to recognize that um, in, in this time when everyone is writing about exploitation and as I mentioned earlier, uh, and you know how writers, t how artists, who are so often, as you say, narcissistic and self-centered, can be cruel and exploitative. But that's not necessarily the end of it. And I will say also, in my, in my work, I used to work in the film industry, uh, as I think you did, or in the television industry. Um, I worked for some, you know, movie stars and and movie directors, very famous people. And yeah, it was exploitative. I mean, sure, they were making millions. I wasn't, <laughs> but I learned everything I know about how to tell a story. I didn't learn it in college. I learned it there in the trenches in Hollywood. And um, even though my goal was always to be a novelist, not to be involved in filmmaking per se, um, directly anyway. So I would say that um, even when there is exploitation, it can be mutually beneficial. And that has been the case in my life. Even when I've been exploited and knew I was being exploited, I have been grateful for what I got out of the relationship. You're enjoying my conversation, which I am certainly grateful for, with my guest, Mitchell James Kaplan. We're talking about his novel, Rhapsody. For more on this and his previous works of historical fiction, visit him at mitchelljameskaplan.com or on social media at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Therese Ann Fowler, author of the bestseller Z and A Good Neighborhood, writes of the novel, We all know Gershwin, but how many know he was the man behind the woman, the conflicted, extraordinary Catherine K. Swift? Mitchell James Kaplan illuminates her in Rhapsody, bringing his impressive knowledge of history, composition, and the heart's whims to bear on this shining rendition of Swift and Gershwin's star-crossed love. Mitchell, what struck me about that review is how your knowledge of music brought Kay and George's working relationship to life. Writing is often a solitary pursuit. You mentioned that your wife will look after, but when you're writing, it's just you and the page. No matter how much you have someone collaborating with you, right, and checking your work and giving you subject suggestions. So how was that experience for you writing Rhapsody? Are you a solitary writer until the moment comes to say, here, you hand your wife that page? You have raised a question that touches on something that's very important to me as an artist. Again, this is not a question that has ever come up in an interview before. But all of your questions, Dean, are extraordinarily intelligent and unusual. Thank um, you. <laughs> um, I can tell, uh, and you succeed. But um, I wake up at three in the morning. I cannot sleep after that. And I have to go right. It absolutely prevents me from sleeping. I wake up, I go. And I walk downstairs and I've got the world to myself. The crickets, you know, and whoever is busy outside in the yard, they're doing their thing and that's fine. Um, that's some of the music after all. It's kind of confirming the ambiance. <laughs> it's a nocturnal experience for me. It comes out of sleep and dreams. And um, I'm not saying I do all my research at night. I do my research during the day but I write at night and it's something very mysterious for me. And I have to be totally alone as I guess, Virginia Woolf, you know, everyone references her when they talk about that subject. Um, it's a, it is definitely a solitary endeavor at that stage when the raw material is being mined out of history and the unconscious and experience. And these voices are talking to you um phase of it is solitary but there are these many other phases and one of them as i said is research i can do research and i do and another thing is obviously feedback from 
editors and everybody else involved in the process. So I don't think of writing as exclusively solitary, but I think of that moment of, 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 of initial creation, the moment when you, when the scene comes alive for you in your mind, that first uh, efflorescence of the visual and the auditory and all of the sensations that go into the scene. That's very, very important to me when I'm writing. I have to see the light in the room. Where's the light coming from? Is it coming from that window? You know, I have to hear the voices of the different characters. It has to be a central experience for me, but only, as I say, initially the most important moment when I have to connect on that level with the scene is when I'm creating the raw material from which the novel will be fashioned later. So another complicated answer. <laughs> <laughs> That's great, in depth, I love it. Well, I'm thinking that you talked about writing and your wife and you said everyone picks Virginia Woolf as being this solitary example of a writer. And I'm thinking, I always say Jack Torrance, what is wrong with me? <laughs> it's not very good to have a wife and liking yourself as a writer to Jack sitting there and demanding you not interrupt him. So that was one, that was one thing that, that struck me when you were saying that. But I, I like to look inside your process and I'm sure that people watching and listening will enjoy that as well because that gives us an insight into what you think is important as you're doing that research. And again, you've brought me right to my next question, which is, in Rhapsody, we see Kay and George take readers up to the legendary Cotton Club. They hear Duke Ellington there, and we get to see them in the jazz age in New York City, the era that my theme song that I use, New York Ain't New York Anymore, which is from 1924, comes from. And it's a, a beautiful, vibrant, alive, neon time in New York City. So how much of what readers will see, where they will travel through Rhapsody, is still there, ghosts of it, echoes of it in New York City of 2021. Um, yeah, well, one thing that is still there is a Radio City Music Hall, which now is like an icon, right, of, of, of that period and of New York. And uh, Kay Swift was a musical director there. She wrote songs. She was on a salary and she was writing for the Rockettes, writing tunes and orchestrating them every day. I did try to call attention in this book to some of the architecture that no longer exists, in part because it's part of the story, and in part because it adds a nostalgic flavor to the story. So there's the Aeolian Hall, where Rhapsody in Blue is first performed. There's the Century Theater, which was a beautiful theater that uh, no longer exists, where Jimmy proposes to Kay. And I set it there in part because his family had actually financed uh, the construction of that building. The other thing about New York, other than that period versus this period, other than the uh, changing physical architecture, is the fact that neighborhoods changed. The character of the neighborhoods changed. And as you point out, the Harlem Renaissance was such an extraordinary time. And um, I'm not going to say that whites and blacks blended in a perfect, seamless way that was not tainted by kind of the racism that permeated society but it was it was it was the beginning i would say of the breakdown of that and it was a powerful experience for the people involved in that including george Gershwin and duke Ellington, k swift so harlem is one area at least parts of harlem that had that vibrant feel that was very special and particular to that time when i was researching the book i was reading about hell's kitchen where there's a little anecdote that I didn't put in the final draft of the book. Jimmy Warburg and Kay Swift go down to Hell's Kitchen. Alex, Alexander Wolcott, he's living with one of the founders of the New Yorker magazine down there in this apartment in Hell's Kitchen. Alexander Wolcott is a famous critic and also a, a great booster of Gershwin and of Kay Swift. So Jimmy and Kay go down to Hell's Kitchen, which is a really, really bad part of town back then. I mean, there's laundry hanging above the streets and, you know, it's it looks poverty. It looks like poverty. And you've got these, you know, the people who were at the beginning of the New Yorker magazine hanging out in this apartment there, duplex or a townhouse, whatever it was. So they go there for a, for a poker game because Alexander Wolcott was like, he, fashion, he he thought of himself as the great, the great poker player come 
literary genius, you know, and challenged Jimmy to come down there. So they went down there and they played poker all night. And Jimmy, who didn't think of himself as a good poker player at all, kept winning. <laughs> and, uh, and he couldn't help it. <laughs> it just kept happening. And he won. And the only thing that remains in my book from that is when he goes to collect his winnings. It's a different scene and it's in the book. But he, we don't show Hell's Kitchen. We don't show the poker game because I felt it slowed down the novel. So did my editor at Simon and Schuster. But um, but he goes to collect his winnings from um, this guy Glazer, who is the uh, the manager, the chief executive of the Cartier shop in Manhattan, and um, and the, and and he collects his winnings in the form of a of a of a of a jewel of a necklace for Kay. And again, this is when he feels his marriage is a little bit uh, threatened, and he's doing his best to make things good with Kay. So that's a that's another aspect of New York that I was aware had changed so much in the interim. You know, just the not just the architecture, but the different neighborhoods and what they were about. You know, even if you think of Times Square and Broadway, it was very different in those days than today. It was very commercial in those days, but it's commercial in, a, in an even more extreme way today, I would say. And you have Tim Pen Alley, which I believe is that where Gershwin oh, yeah. was born? Is he Tim Pen Alley? Yeah. Tim, Tim Pen Alley is a great example of a neighborhood that where all the music publishers were there, and you'd walk down the street and hear all the pianists demonstrating the song. Gershwin starts out as a pianist demonst at 16, demonstrating new songs on Tin Pan Alley. Couldn't just have a, an MP3 file or, you know, Pro Tunes or whatever they use today to demo music. They, you had to go, if you're an artist, let's say you're a singer, you want to hear the latest songs that these publishers have chosen, selected. You're going to go to from one publisher to another, and people are going to be playing them for you on the piano. And Gershwin was doing that. That was his job when he was 16. He wasn't born there in Tin Pan Alley, but um, certainly he grew up there. Yeah, he, he, lived in, he lived in Brooklyn. He lived in uh, the Lower East Side. He lived in Harlem for a while. He lived in various places. His father was just kind of, you know, <laughs> doing what he could to survive can't help but pick up that music. And for me, you mentioned Radio City Music Hall and I worked there. My office was right above that awning on Sixth wow. Avenue for 15 years. And I just, being somebody who loves history, right? And then you'd go down some of those side roads there and go down what was Tim Penn Alley and go past where, again, all those places that are named there in New York in New York anymore, Murray's and Churchill's and Rector's and the Roxy, yeah. which is where the Rockettes end up getting their name yeah. from. There's well, so many of those echoes. It's it's a period that was so alive, especially in the music here of Gershwin and of Kay Swift that it, it refuses to be paved over, it refuses to be knocked down. Yes. We're, we're still searching for it today. And you write, in fact, or you have said that in many ways, my novel is a thank you letter to music for the ways that it has colored my perceptions and reminiscence. And that that strikes me that this is what this book gives us. It gives us a chance to share that, to have it color our perceptions. And I think you'd, you'd probably like that. That's a high compliment from a reader. Well, I, I, I felt that um, as I was writing the book, I came to feel strongly that there's a lot to celebrate about, about our cultural inheritance from that period. And especially for New Yorkers. Um, for all of America, but it was ra it was r radiating out from New York, and it conquered the world that culture, and there's a hell of a lot to be proud of and to celebrate and to and to enjoy uh, in that heritage. So you're absolutely right. As far as the Roxy Theater, that guy whom that theater is named after, who developed that theater, he was part of that scene, that same scene. He developed these grandiose venues for shows that was his job <laughs> yeah yeah it was his thing and this is also you mentioned the duke the great duke duke ellington he calls new york city the capital of everything and this is when that all happens and this is the yeah. soundtrack of that transformation of this city becoming the place that everybody looks and of course the downside was then aliens would always want to land in new york city so that wasn't a good thing but that's just <laughs> that's just in the films right that but it's just such a Godzilla. beautiful time <laughs> yeah <Godzilla. laughs> forgettably once yeah but so. <laughs> so i wanted to ask you a final question as we wrap it up 
as a Gershwin tune, as a K-Swift tune, sticks in your head. Rhapsody certainly does. Put those together, and I wonder what you hope readers will be metaphorically humming in their head out of your novel after they finish reading it that will stick to them. Maybe the next time they're walking in New York City and they, they see a wrought iron fence and wonder if it was there in the jazz age or they look up at Radio City. What do you hope readers will carry with them that you baked here into Rhapsody? Well, I would say that um, as I just suggested in answer to the last question, um, I hope that they will I hope that people who are already familiar with this music, as you apparently are, uh, that they'll hear it in their head, of course. And I know that a number of readers, have, many, many readers have told me that. And I love that, of course. But I also hope that this book will introduce that music and that period to people who are not familiar with it and that they will learn to appreciate it because there's so much there to be enjoyed and valued. And it's so much of who we are today. And I guess I'd like to say there's something very upbeat about it. And I guess I feel we can all use some of that right now. Anytime. It's definitely a book to yeah. pick up. And if even if you know somebody who's down and you know likes music or likes the period or needs a pick me up, pick up an extra copy of Rhapsody for them. And again, uh, this is not you're you're not paying me to, to be your publicist, but I'm just passionate. About <laughs> you're doing the books. a great job. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just passionate about the books that that I read. I'm so glad you shared Rhapsody with me today, Mitchell James Kaplan. Thank you so much for introducing me to George Gershwin and K Swift. I certainly am able to hear those songs in a whole new way now. These enduring Broadway tunes. I wish you the best of luck with the novel, and hope everyone will pick it up for themselves, for friends, for when it comes time for the holidays. Buy it for for everybody. You will be giving them a piece of New York history, but also a great piece of Jazz Age New York and a great read. Thank you again for your time. Dean, you've been just a joy to talk with and to get to know. Thank you. You're welcome. Anytime, come back for your next novel. Okay. Deal. Again, the novel is Rhapsody. As always, you can find the Amazon link to purchase your copy at the historyauthor.com page for this episode. Every time you buy a book through us, you not only get a great read because I stand behind all my authors and the books that I choose to focus on, but you help keep the flux capacitor on our time machine humming like usual. My thanks to Mitchell James Kaplan for joining us and for bringing to life the love story of Swift and Gershwin. It was a forbidden love, but it was a wildly productive partnership. Visit MitchellJamesKaplan.com for more, or connect with him on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, where you can find me as well. Plus, we hope you'll subscribe to our YouTube channel for future conversations. That's it for this installment of the History Author Show. I hope you'll join us for our next all-new interview right here on iHeartRadio or wherever you enjoy the program. Until that next trip into the past together, on behalf of Mitchell James Kaplan, Thanks so much for time traveling with us today, and have a great week. We still call it Broadway, but what's in a name? Take it from Georgie, it isn't the same. On the east side, west side, things ain't like before. There are tears in the 